Hello everyone, welcome to this virtual tour of Paranal Observatory. My name is Hector and I will be your guide today. So allow, allow me to introduce myself. I'm a PhD student at the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Germany. I work mostly with topics related to the circumgalactic medium, that is the environment that is surrounding the galaxies. And I've been a member of the team of guides for Paranal Observatory since 2019. Back then when I was doing my master's in Antofagasta. So uh, if you have any questions or comments during the tour, please, you can leave it in either Facebook or the YouTube chat, and we'll have some pauses along the tour to answer any questions you may have. So let's begin by talking a bit about ISO. So ISO, the European Southern Observatory, is an international organization that is comprised of 16 member states. And I will put here an image on the screen when you can see the different members of ISO. So that so you have, you have Denmark, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Belgium, France, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Finland, Germany, Poland, Czech Republic, Austria, Switzerland, Italy. And we also have some non-European countries. We have Australia that joined recently as a strategic partner. And we also have Chile. Chile is the host country. The telescopes and the observatories controlled by ESO, they are all built in Chile. Now, why, what is the mission of ESO? So the mission of ESO is to promote an advanced research and collaboration in the field of astronomy. And to this end, ESO was looking for places to build observatories in the Southern Hemisphere. And Chile just happens to be one of the best places to do this because we have uh, the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile. At the same time, in the, in the 60s, Chile was looking to attract human capital to the country. And since ISO was looking for the best place, what happened to happen is that Chile offered land and ISO started building telescopes there. And there are three different observation sites in Chile. So we have here in these slides, we have first La Silla, that was the first observatory inaugurated in the 60s. And his star instrument, his star telescope is the 3.6 meter telescope. And you also have the entity or the new technology telescope. One of the main instruments that is currently at La Silla is HARPS. And this is an instrument specialized in detecting exoplanets. Now, more to the north of Chile, we have Changnantor. In the Changnantor Plateau, we have Apex and Alma. These are antenna for radio astronomy. And in the case of Alma, it's not just um, it's not, not just ISO that one that is controlling and operating Alma. It's a joint effort between ISO, the US, and some countries in Asia Pacific. And so it's part of ISO, but not just of ISO, like the C Observatory or Paraná Observatory. Then in the uh, Antofagasta region, we also have Paranal and Armazones. So in Paranal, we have the BLT, the Very Large Telescope, and the BLTI, the Very Large Telescope Interferometer. Additionally, we have some survey telescopes like VISTA and BST. And we have CTA Sur, that is in construction, and is an array of antennas that is going to be focused on detecting gamma rays. Now, near Paranal, actually very near Paranal, we have the Amazonas, where the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, is currently being built. And the ELT is actually is going to be handled from Paranal Observatory. So with this, we have a bit of an idea of what ESO is and what the observational facilities in Chile are. So now let's travel to Paranal Observatory, the place that we are going to show you today. So we're going to virtually travel. And here we are traveling across the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile. So we are more than a thousand kilometers north of the capital, Santiago, traveling to one of the driest deserts in the world. There in the distance, we can see the Paranal Mountain. Now. 
here the Panama Mountain is part of the called Coast Mountain Range or Cordillera de la Costa in Spanish. And these are uh, coastal mountain, uh, mountain range that is near the coast of Chile. And here we are actually at a straight line at 12 kilometers away from the coast. So you may wonder, can we see the ocean in this video? Well, actually, you could, except that it's covered by clouds. If you take a look in the distance, there is a haze, a bit of cloudy haze. The ocean is right below those clouds. And why are there clouds here? Well, that is because of the Humboldt current. So this is a current of very cold waters that come from the Antarctic and goes through the coast of Chile and Peru. And this water current produces an effect known as thermic inversion. And basically this produces that. The, the humidity stay below 1000 meters. And the coast mountain range is above 2000 meters. So here we are above the clouds. Now, we also have another natural barrier that uh, allows us to have a very good place to do astronomy here. So in the opposite direction to, towards the east, we have the Andes mountains range that has very tall mountains over 6,000 meters. And these mountains, they stop the clouds coming from Bolivia and Argentina. And the result is a very dry, very arid desert that you can see here. This place is ideal for astronomical observation from the Earth because it's very dry. The air is very calm, very transparent. We have on average more than 300 clear nights in the year. Now, let's change a bit the view so we can get closer to the observatory. Okay, so here we see the top of Parallel Mountain and Paranal in the Quechua language means whirlwind. This is probably a reference to the whirlpools that sometimes form in the desert because of the wind, but usually the air here is very calm. And here you can see that the top of the mountain has been cut, you have been a road and some, you can also see the telescopes. So this is clearly not an ordinary mountain, it's a very special place where a lot of science is being done. So, let's view and let's put ourselves on top of the mountain. And let me a second here. So, okay, so here we are in the main platform of Parallel Observatory. Now, here we have the BLT. And the first thing you should notice is that the BLT, the very large telescope, is not a single telescope. It's a set of four very big telescopes that we have here. Each one of them is referred to as UT. So we have UT1, UT2, UT3, and UT4. Additionally, we have some smaller telescopes, like this one over here. These are the so-called auxiliary telescopes. And we have four. So we have one here, two, three, and four. Now, one thing that you may notice is that we have some tracks here. So why do we have tracks? Well, the auxiliary telescopes, the AT, they can be moved. And if you take a look at this trapdoor over here, there are about 30 of those in the platform. And we can put the auxiliary telescope in any of those 30 positions. So you may be wondering, why do we move? The, why, why is this necessary? That is because the auxiliary telescopes, they work using a technique called interferometry. When we're doing interferometry, the four telescopes, the four auxiliary telescopes, are observing the same object in the sky at the same time. Now, we can also do interferometry with the four big ones, or we can use the four big ones, each one observing an independent and separate objects. And we have a, a small video to show you a bit better how interferometry works. So, give me a second. So, here we have. So, we point the four telescopes to the same object in the sky, and then we have to combine the lights. And this 
is done in an analog way. This is not a post-processing of the image. The light for the telescopes is sent through underground tunnels into this Celtran building that is the interferometry building. Now, this is a very high precision operation and is very, very difficult to do. So you may be wondering, why are we doing this? What is the benefit of doing interferometry? Well, the benefit is that we can improve the quality of our, of our images. And for this, what is important is what is known as the baseline, and that is the separation among the telescopes. The baseline is going to change our resolution, and that is our ability to differentiate two objects in the sky. So if two stars are too close in the sky and we have low resolution, we just see a single star. But if we have a very high resolution, we can see them as two different objects. And with interferometry, we get a resolution equivalent of a single telescope whose diameter is equal to the separation between the telescopes. Now, this only allows to improve on the resolution, but not on the amount of light that we can collect. So that means that we cannot see objects that are fainter, and they can be fainter because they are much farther away or because they are intrinsically fainter. So that's why we are still building very large telescopes. Now, the 80s over here, they have a primary mirror that is 1.8 meters in diameter. The UDs, they have a primary mirror that is 8.2 meters in diameter. And the ELT that is being built in Cerro Amazones, which is over here, that's going to be at about 40 meters in diameter. Now, the four big telescopes, as I already mentioned, we call them UD, but we also give them names in the Mapudungun language. So the Mapudungun is the language of the Mapuche, the natives of the central and southern part of Chile. And in that language, the names are, for UD1, is Antu, which means the sun. Then we have, for UD2, Cuellen, which means the moon. Then we have, for UD3, Melipal. And Melipal means something like four stars, and it's a reference to the Southern Cross constellation. And finally, we have over here, Jebun. And Jebun means something like the star of the dawn. It's a reference to Venus, basically. Now, the four big telescopes, the four UTs, they are identical. The main difference is that they have different instruments. Each one of them has three cameras, and they are different. Each of the three cameras is different, and also different from the cameras of the other ones. So because of time constraints, we cannot enter to the four telescopes. So we're going to enter just one. We are going to go to UT3 or Melipal. But don't worry, as I already mentioned, the structure of the four telescopes is essentially the same. So here we are entering to UT3 or Melipal. Now, the first thing that you just notice is that this is very big. Here we are essentially in the fourth floor of the telescope. And if we take a look around, we see some engineers here working in this image, so that gives you an idea of the scale of this. Now, the mirror over here is 8.2 meters in diameter, made out of a single piece. Larger telescopes like the ELT, they are going to have, they have segmented mirrors made of many different pieces. This is a monolithic mirror out of a single piece. It's made of a special material called Cirodur, that is a mix of glass and ceramic. And the surface layer is of aluminum, and that is what gives the reflectivity. Now, this is only 17 centimeters thick. So it's very large, but not too thick. And the whole mirror plus this wide structure that is supporting it, it weighs about 22 tons. How does this telescope operate at night? Well, the telescope has two motions. So this blue part that is the mount of the telescope is fixed. And this part can 
change its inclination. That's one movement. For the second movement, if you notice here, this part of the floor is separated from the rest. That is because this whole part can rotate in 360 degrees. So combining this inclination motion plus this rotation, we can point at any place in the sky. Now, before we do that, of course at night, we need to open the dome. And over here, we have the doors or the window of the dome that opens to the side. And this mirror had, this telescope had three mirrors. So we have the primary here. There is a secondary mirror on top, and there is a third mirror that we cannot see very well on this image. So how does this work at night? Well, we have a small animation here to show you this. And of course, this is exaggerated. The dome doesn't open this much. And well, the light is going to come from the sky, going to hit the primary mirror, bounce, then goes to the secondary, bounce, and then goes to the third mirror. And the third mirror can send the sun to the right, to one of the cameras, or to the left, to a different camera, or it can let the lights go straight through it to a camera at the bottom of the telescope. So the function of the third mirror is to allow us to select which instrument we're going to use. Let's go back to the telescope and let's go down. So here we are underneath the mirror and here we have one of the instruments. In this case, it's called Symphony. And one thing that I want to show you here is these little gray boxes. There are about 150 of those. And these are the so-called actuators. They are basically pistons. They can push or pull. So why are they here? Well, they are part of what is called the active optics. So this mirror, as I already mentioned, is made of a special material called Zero-Dur. And this material has a degree of flexibility. And this is important. If this were to be just glass or some more rigid material, when the telescope, when the mirror is tilted, it will be suffering too much stress due to its own weight. So it would break. So we need it to be somewhat flexible in order to have a lighter mirror. So the problem with that is that the curve of the mirror is going to change depending on the inclination. And that is where the actuators come into play. So there are sensors that are constantly measuring the curve of the mirror and the actuators, they are correcting it. So we are actively correcting the curve of the mirror, hence the name's active optics. This is one of the technologies that make Parallel Observatory one of the most advanced in the world. Another technology that makes this a very advanced observatory is the adaptive optics. And that is to adapt to the changes in the atmosphere. Now, we have talked about some things now. So let's see, we have some questions that we can answer right now. So let's see. So we have a question here. How was the mirror transported to its location safely? Okay, so the mirror was built in Germany, if I recall correctly. Then it was sent to France to be polished. And then it was sent by a ship to the Antofagasta port. And then it was put on a truck and very slowly driven to Paranal. So from Antofagasta to Paranal, it's at about one hour and a half, two hours maybe. But they were going much more slower than the speed limit. So it took them a long time. Uh, a friend of mine that is also a guide for Paranal, he was in high school at the time. And he remembers having seen the truck passing through the streets of Antofagasta because he lived there. And it was a whole event for the city. And this was done very carefully because there actually there are no replacements for the mirrors. So if one of the mirrors breaks, uh, we, we have no way to replace them because also the the molds that were used to build them they are they don't longer exist. Now, uh, I don't see more question. We have some greetings here. So we have greetings from Amsterdam, also from. Brazil, 
and some more people, I guess maybe from Brazil, maybe Portugal, because they are speaking Portuguese. So I remind you that you can make your questions at any time in the tour. And since we don't have any questions at this point, I'm going to answer one of the usual questions that people ask. How do you clean the mirrors? Because the mirrors need to be clean, right? So there are two ways to clean the mirrors. One is a more simple method of cleaning it. And for this, basically, what we do is that we tilt the mirror and then an engineer or someone using this lift spray the mirror with a form of carbon dioxide. The foam will fall because of gravity and it will drag any dust particles that may be in the surface of the mirror. And this is done every other week. There is a more difficult or more elaborate process that is the realuminization of the mirror. And for this, the whole mirror plus this white subordinate structure is removed from the telescope. And we do that using this yellow crane that we see out here. Then we put the mirror in a special truck, take it to base camp, and there is a special building when the aluminum layer of the mirror is removed. And then in a different chamber, a new layer is put into place. This whole process takes about a week. During that week, there is no mirror in the telescope, so it cannot be used. And this is done every 18 months but it's done in a sequential order. So if we do it today for UT1, 18 months later, it will be the turn of UT2. And after that, 18 months later for UT3, and so on and so on. Okay, now, we have a question here. Could you talk about the software and the user interface for the observations? And how do you manage the proposals? Okay, we're gonna to talk about this and in our next stop of the tour, that is the control room. Uh, but before we're gonna answer a question here, why does the mirror need to be realuminized? Okay, so the first method of cleaning the mirror is not perfect. And as anyone that has a mirror in her bathroom have experience, cleaning mirrors is annoying. If you have some watermarks of something, they're very hard to remove. Now, he don't have rain and we protect the mirror so humidity doesn't really get into them. But not all the dust can be removed. And essentially, we are losing reflectivity due to time. So the, the amount of reflectivity that we can gain by doing the realuminization is not marginal. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's say maybe 10 to 20% more gaining light because we have a shiny new mirror. So basically this is just to make sure that the quality of the observation doesn't degrade in because of the time. Because you know it's going to be dust falling into the mirror. We try to control the humidity by having the mirrors enclosed in a dome, but this is not perfect. So there are going to be issues with this. Okay, so let's continue with the tour. And we are going to go to the control room. Okay, so at night, there cannot be no one inside the telescopes because they need to be completely dark. Otherwise, the light will interfere with the observations. So everybody is working from the control room and the control room is over here. And well, here, also here in the distance, you can see the sea of clouds. Underneath that clouds is the Pacific Ocean. So. Here we see the control building from the side. And here, there are not only the places to control the observation, there are also some office for management people, from engineers. So people work here, basically. And here we are inside the control building. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of computers, a lot of keyboards, screens. So you may think that a lot of people work here at night. So the first thing to show is that this place over here is just for one of the four big mirrors. So if we go over here, 
here we can see that there is a sign that says UT3 or Melipal. That's because this part over here is just to control the UT3 telescope. Over here on the side, we have for UT4. So this is just for the UT4 telescope. Over here we have, we don't see it too well, but we have the part that is used to control some of the survey telescopes. So we have the STM Vista and also to control the interferometry. And for here we have for UT1. And here we're back inside this for UT2. Now, there are a lot of chairs here, a lot of keyboards, but at night there is usually going to be just two people here. There's going to be an astronomer and a telescope and instrument operator. So these telescopes, they are highly advanced and they're also very expensive. So they don't trust those astronomers to handle them. There is a specific job that is to control and manipulate the telescopes. And that is the job of the telescope and instrument operators. Now, you can think of this as a pilot and a copilot in a plane or in a rally car. So the telescope operator, he's the pilot, he's handling the machine. And the astronomer, he handles the route. He tells what to observe and he handles the science aspects. Now, why so many computers, so many screens, if only two people are going to be here at night? Well, you have to remember, each of these four big telescopes has three instruments, three cameras. So we're going to have a dedicated computer for each camera. Also, we are going to have a dedicated computer to move and manipulate the telescope. We also need some extra screens with information about the weather. If the weather conditions are bad, we need to close. So usually rain or clouds are not a problem here. We have a very nice sky, but sometimes we have problem with the wind. If the wind speed is too high, we need to close. Why? Because if a small pebble gets lift because of the wind and then hits one of the mirrors, that would be bad. So we have to pay very close attention to the weather conditions. Now, uh, we have a question about the software that is used here. Uh, I don't know the specific of the software, but this is more likely a custom version of, of Linux that is being used for this. It's most definitely not Windows. Actually, most astronomers and most uh, job related to astronomy is not done in Windows. It's done either in Mac or in Linux. Now, what do you have to do if you want to observe here, well, you have to apply for observation time. And there are a couple of times a year where the application time for observations are opened. And you have to send your proposal. And this proposal has to be very complete. You have to say what you want to observe, what are the scientific reasons that you want to observe this object, with which telescope, with which instrument, how many time of observation do you need? How much distance between your object and the moon should be for the observations to be scientifically useful? Uh, whether the other telescopes have observed this object before, etc., etc. And then a committee is going to decide to who keep the time. So any astronomer of any part of the world can apply to get observation time. And the best scientific proposals are going to get time. But this is highly, very highly competitive. There is not enough time to give to everybody. And actually, we receive over seven times more proposals than the time that we have available to assign. And so, okay, so what happened after you have the fortune of have your proposal accepted? Well, you have two choices. Now, there, are, there is the service mode and the visitor mode. So in the service mode, you give your, the instruction of the observations to an astronomer of the ESO staff, and they handle the observations for you. In the visitor mode, you travel, you sit here on the chair, and you supervise the observations. Now, the drawback is that 
if the day that you travel to Chile and go to Antofagasta to observe is a bad day because there is clouds or something, this cannot be rescheduled. You lose your time. In the service mode, there is a bit more leeway because the astronomers from the ISO staff, they can try to choose the best night for that observation throughout the year. There's no guarantee that can be rescheduled, but there is a bit more leeway. At about 70% of the observations are done in the service mode. Now, after that, after you have your observations, they are private for the astronomers that sent the proposal for about one year, and they have that period of time to advance in their science. After that, everything is made public, and all the observations are uploaded to the ESO archive, and any astronomer can create an account there and download the observations. Uh, I have done it. And usually what you do when you are going to do that, you send an email to the primary astronomer of that observation. You tell them that you want to use their observations to do this science or that other science. And sometimes they'll ask you if they can collaborate with you in the project. Sometimes they say, OK, there's no problem. Just use them. Sometimes they will say, OK, I got funding to for some agencies, so please add this recognition when you publish something. Astronomy is actually a very collaborative science. Most of the work is done by teams of people, not just by a single astronomer. So uh, I hope that gives you an idea of what is the process to observe here and a professional observatory. OK, and I hope that partially answers some of the questions that Hengamesh uh, had. Uh, now, we are, have some questions here about how many engineers, scientists, support staff live there and work full time. Actually, most of the people working here, they are uh, support staff and engineers. The astronomers are the intimate minority here. And there should be at about 200 people or so working in the observatory each day. They usually work in shifts. So one week up the observatory, that's the maximum amount of time they have. I don't remember correctly, it was maybe one week or two weeks, but there is a maximum amount of time that they can be here before they need to go back to their play, to their homes. So, so yeah, and let's see if we have more questions. Okay, so we have a question from Kurenin. How far away from the observatory do the people working here live? Okay, so actually in the final part of the tour, we're going to show you the residence. And that is the place where the astronomers stay where they are working here. It's actually not too far from here. So the, it's below in the mountain. The main platform is at 2,600 meters above sea level. And the base camp is at 2,400 meters. It's to be less than one kilometer distance from the top. We have also a question here. Whether do we have our own electric plant? OK, so. When the observatory was built, it was built with its own electric plant. Now, after some years passed, the observatory was connected to the electric grid of Chile, and the electric plant was left as a, as a backup in case of a power outage. And now there have been some discussions to move into more renewable form of, of energy. So there, there are something look, they're looking into solar, uh, solar panels and things like that. But at, at a, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, at right now, we are still just working connected to the electric grid of Chile. OK, so we talk about how to send proposals and get them accepted here. What are the scientific discoveries that have been done so we have a, a small video with the top 10 scientific discoveries, not just from Parallel Observatory, but from all the observatories that are part of ESO. So here we go with that video. Observations with ESO telescopes 
have led to many breakthroughs in astronomy and, over the years, have been responsible for some truly remarkable findings. Here is our list of ESO's top 10 astronomical discoveries so far. Astronomers using ESO's Very Large Telescope have discovered by far the brightest galaxy yet found in the early universe and found strong evidence that examples of the first generation of stars lurk within it, stars that were previously only theoretical. These massive brilliant objects were the creators of the first heavy elements in history, elements that are necessary to forge the stars we see around us today the planets that orbit them, and life as we know it. ESO telescopes have provided definitive proof that long gamma-ray bursts are linked with the climatic explosions of massive stars, therefore solving an enduring mystery. A telescope at La Silla was also able to observe the visible light from a short gamma-ray burst for the first time, showing that this family of objects most likely originates from colliding neutron stars. Astronomers using ESO's HARPS instrument in 2010 discovered a planetary system containing at least five planets orbiting the Sun-like star HD 10180. They also found evidence that two other planets may be present, one of which, if confirmed, would be among the lowest mass exoplanets ever found. Newer observations and reanalysis of the data suggest that there could be even more planets around this star. ESO's Very Large Telescope was used to detect carbon monoxide molecules in a remote galaxy seen as it was 11 billion years ago, a feat that had remained elusive for 25 years. This allowed astronomers to obtain the most precise measurement of the cosmic temperature at such a remote epoch, and it matched the temperature predicted by the Big Bang Theory. The atmosphere around a super-Earth exoplanet was analysed for the first time using the VLT. The planet, which is known as GJ1214b, was studied as it passed in front of its parent star, and some of the starlight filtered through the planet's atmosphere. The atmosphere was found to be either mostly water in the form of steam, or dominated by thick clouds or haze. Using ESO's VLT, astronomers measured the age of the oldest star known in the Milky Way. At 13.2 billion years old, the star was born in the earliest era of star formation in the universe. Uranium was also detected in a Milky Way star and used as an independent estimate of the age of the galaxy. The VLT obtained the first ever image of a planet outside our solar system. The planet, which has a mass about five times that of Jupiter, orbits a failed star, a brown dwarf, at a distance of 55 times the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. In 2014, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, revealed remarkable details of a solar system that is forming. The images of HL Tauri were the sharpest ever made at sub-millimeter wavelengths. They show how forming planets are vacuuming up dust and gas in a protoplanetary disk. One of ESO's proudest moments came when two independent research teams, including ESO staff, arrived at a truly revolutionary finding that the cosmos is not only expanding, but that it is doing so at an increasing rate. The findings of the separate teams were based on observations of exploding stars, or supernovae, including measurements made from ESO's telescopes at La Silla and Paranal. This discovery was rewarded with the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. 
And finally, several of ESO's flagship telescopes were used in a 20-year study to obtain the most detailed view ever of the surroundings of the monster lurking at the heart of our galaxy, a supermassive black hole. Astronomy is always moving forwards, and ESO's top 10 scientific discoveries are not set in stone. Okay, so that was the top 10 discoveries made with ESO observatories. And we have uh, an extra one. So the Event Horizon Telescope, EST, an array of eight ground-based telescopes distributed throughout the planet, coordinated by an international collaboration, achieved the first direct visual evidence of a supermassive black hole and its shadow. This image reveals the black hole at the center of Messier 87, a massive galaxy in the nearby Virgo Galaxy Cluster. This black hole is 55 million light years from Earth and has a mass of 6.5 billion times that of the Sun. And there you can see the image of the black hole in the screen. Okay, now, so, uh, in addition to this virtual tour of Panel Observatory, there are also in-person tours every Saturday. There is one at 10 a.m. and one at 2 p.m. These are completely free. You just need to register in a website prior to that, and you need to arrive at the observatory by your own means. And there are also tours of La Silla Observatory as well. Now, but one thing that we cannot show you in the in-person tours is the night sky at the observatory, because that where is when everybody is working here. But in this virtual tour, we can. So here we have a very beautiful image of the night sky at the main platform of Paranal Observatory. So let's take a, a look around a bit first. So very beautiful image, taken not too long after the sunset. We can see still a bit, a bit of light here. So let's talk about, about the sky a bit. So over here we have Orion, who in the Greek mythology was a hunter. So here we have Betelgeuse, which from time to time is making news because he's changed its brightness. And it's suspected that here in the next maybe 100, 200 years, Betelgeuse will explode as a supernova. So every change in the brightness of Betelgeuse is always interesting. And over here we have Orion's Belt, or as this is known in Chile, Las Tres Marias, the Three Marys. Over here we have Orion's Nebula, and this is a star forming zone. So very close to Orion's, we have over here Sirius, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, after the sun, of course, and is part of the Canis Majoris constellation, so the big dog. Orion was a hunter, and over here is the dog that accompanied the hunter in his, his travels. Over here, we have Taurus. So we, got his, we can see here Aldebaran, the brightest star in the Taurus constellation. And over here, we have the Pleiades. And this is an open cluster of stars, which is very beautiful and is a favorite among amateur astronomers. And some of these objects, we can see them from the northern hemisphere as well. So the big difference between Orion, looking at here in this image from Panel Observatory, and Orion that you can see from Europe, let's say, is that it's upside down. Now, if we look towards the south, we can see some constellations that we cannot see from the northern hemisphere. So among those things, we have over here these two hazy objects. These are the Magellanic clouds. So you have the big Magellanic clouds and the small one. And we can use the Magellanic clouds to find the celestial south pole. So or like in the northern hemisphere, where we have the Polaris, the North Star, in the southern celestial pole, there is no bright star marking it. 
But what we can do is take the big Magellanic cloud, the small one, and build a triangle. And in this missing vertex uh, of the triangle, that should be the southern Celestian pole. And if we go toward the Earth, over there should be the southern direction. That's one way that we can find the south. Another way is using the Southern Cross constellation. So the Southern Cross is over here. So we have the big stick and the small stick of the Southern Cross. So we take the big one and we extend it one, two, three, three and a half times. Some people say four, I uh, hear more times than three and a half. And we get to the same pole point marking the Southern Celestial Pole. Over here we also have some other constellations. So we have over here Alpha and Beta Centauri. So near to Alpha Centauri, we have Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the Earth. And over here we have the spiral arm of the Milky Way. Now, the people that used to live here in the desert, they have their own constellations that are different from the ones that we have from that we inherit from the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans. And they used to see the Milky Way as a river. And to this river, animals will come to drink. So they make shapes using these more darker regions. So over here, for instance, we have the head of a llama. So we have here the neck, the mouth, over here's the eye, then we have the ears. And depending on the time of the year, we can see the rest of the body of the llama. And the llama comes here to drink at this river. And over here we have the, what is known in the, as the coal sack. But it was for the people living here, this was a bird that was drinking in this river. So that gives give you an idea that, of how the vision of the people living here. So there are so many stars visible from the southern hemisphere that they can do constellation using the shadow regions instead of just connecting the brightest stars, which is different from what was done in Europe. Now, let's go back to the day and let's head to our final destination, that is the base camp. So, the base camp is over here. So it's very close to the top of the mountain. So we have a road there to go to the top. And this is like a mini city. So we have some workshop for fixing machinery to create replacement parts. We have the building where the realization of the mirror is done. And we also some some places for people to, to live to sleep. We also have an infirmary. Somewhere over here is the power plant. We have over here a gym. And we are heading now towards the residency. So this is the residency. And this sort of makes it look like, like it's underground. But it's not. It's actually just built using the shape of the mountain. So it's one, in one of the slopes of the mountain. And this is a building that won some architectural awards when it was built. And let's take a look around over here. So here we have a very beautiful desertic landscape. But if we go inside, we can see something that is completely different. So we have here a lot of green. So there are a lot of plants here, and you can see that there is also a swimming pool. And this is not just so people can swim and relax. The air in the desert is very dry. And that is not good for your skin and for your health for, to a, for a long period of time. So this pool over here allows us to have a higher humidity inside of the building. And we can also have this very beautiful vegetation that allow you to relax your view a bit. Over here, we have this curtain on the center of this. And 
or like the curtains that we have in our homes that we close them to prevent the light from the outside to come in inside. The objective of this curtain is that to prevent the light from the inside of the building to go outside. So this is open at night so we can turn off the lights inside this building without polluting the observations being carried outside. Now, this building has 108 rooms. They are over this way. It also has some offices over here. It has a library. Here's the lobby. Here's the cafeteria. There is a game room. Uh, there's a music room and so on and so on. You have to remember people stay here for a week, sometimes more. So they need to be able to relax and have a normal life, you know. You need to have a good work balance equilibrium with your life. So they need to have some uh, some time to relax and some something to do in that time. Now, a bit of trivia fact is that this building was used in a James Bond movie in Quantum of Solace with uh, Daniel Craig. And in that movie, it was the layer of the villain of the movie. Okay, so we are getting near towards the end of our tour. So let's see if we have some more questions that I can answer for you. Okay, so... Okay, I have a question over here. Who is the founder of ISO? Okay, I don't have the answer to this one out of the top of my head. Uh, so I look over here a bit. And the idea of building ISO was originally put forward by two people. So there was Walter Bade and Jan Ort. And they come up with the idea of doing this in the 50s. Uh, but I'm not really sure if they were actually the founders in the end or not. So sorry for not being able to give you a completely satisfactory answer for that. OK, so I would like to mention to you that you can always go to the ISO website, www.iso.org, and there you will find this virtual tour that you can follow at your own leisure, and also virtual tools for Alma and La Silla. You will also find a lot of pictures and videos that you can use. And in case we don't have any more questions, I think we are about at right time to end this tour. It was my pleasure to be your guide today. If you know someone who likes this type of content, please let them know. We do these virtual tours every Saturday. We are usually alternating between Spanish tours and English tours, and also between La Silla Observatory and Panama Observatory. So keep an eye on our social networks to know when and where the next virtual tour is going to be. So in the name of ISO, I say goodbye to everyone of you. Uh, thank you for uh, connecting today. And it was my pleasure being your guy. And maybe see you in a different opportunity. Goodbye.